Hi, and welcome to Uncle Scott's Kitchen. Today we've got an in-depth review of this, a large 12-inch carbon steel skillet. We've got a lot of very good cooking tests, going to cook some delicious food, maybe some that's a little perplexing. <laughs> We're going to go through the pan stats and features. We're going to check out the handle, the cooking surface, the seasoning. We'll compare and contrast it to some of the lodge cast irons, maybe some of the French carbon steels, and try to figure out if this is a great frying pan that you need or not. I don't know. Let's get started and find out. Overview. Let's jump right in and get to know the pan. It's a 12-incher, a pretty big pan. It arrives pre-seasoned, which I tend to think of as kind of a starter seasoning, which should improve the more we cook. We'll show some simple seasoning methods later. Now, pre-seasoning means there's no need to do an initial seasoning. You can just wash it and start cooking. For comparison, most French carbon steels arrive covered in beeswax, which can be kind of a headache to remove and require an initial seasoning. It weighs in at a little over four pounds. Now, excuse me for a moment while I note that in my pan journal. <laughs> what? So at four pounds, it's a medium weight carbon steel. For comparison, that's a little over a pound heavier than a Moviel M-Steel 11-inch carbon steel. It's in the same weight range as the popular 11 and 7 8 inch Matfer, about two pounds lighter than a 12 and a half inch Dubouillet Mineral B Pro, and over three pounds lighter than a similarly sized 12 inch Lodge cast iron. So this Lodge is right in the middle of the range as far as weight for carbon steel, and it definitely saves you some weight compared to heavier cast iron. Now the surface of the pan has a rough texture to it. You can really feel it. It's different than the French carbon steels. They arrive smooth and stay smooth even after seasoning. It's even rougher than a lodge cast iron. Now does that texture affect how food slides around in the pan? We'll show some examples of that when we get to the cooking test in a few minutes. The handle. Now let's talk about the handle. Handles are super important when it comes to carbon steel skillets. Why? because the material used for the handle determines whether the pan can be used in the oven or not. For example, lots of the French carbon steels have coated handles. These handles can't go in the oven for very long, else the coating will melt. And here's where this lodge pan really had me flummoxed for a bit. It's presented as a carbon steel pan with silicone handles. And when I was researching this pan, I assumed that the silicone handle was attached and that the pan wouldn't go in the oven. This bothered me to the point that I held off on buying this pan for about four months. Well, lo and behold, it turns out that the silicone protector is not attached at all, but rather a removable grip. It's shaped to fit the thumb groove in the handle and kind of looks like a little smile. Now, if my wife wanted to use this pan for one of her pan sauces, so the handle itself is made from the same rough carbon steel as the rest of the pan. And this means that with the protector removed, the pan can indeed be used in the oven, not only for seasoning, but also for cooking, such as browning meat on the stovetop and then finishing in the oven, which we'll test here in a minute. Now without the silicone grip attached, the smoother, softer feeling coated handles of the French pans like this Dubouillet feel better to me, but, with the silicone grip attached, I really like the Lodge's grip better. I like the feel of it, especially for bigger hands, and I think it makes the pan much more maneuverable than without it. The fact that you can use the pan with the grip or without really gives this pan a lot of versatility, and I really do like that. Shape. This Lodge pan is significantly shorter, shallower, and has thinner metal than comparably sized Debouillet Pros and this Lodge cast iron skillet. You can really see the height differentials here. The sides are not as steeply angled as the Lodge cast iron. You probably would not want to use this for cornbread. You can tell that the metal is not quite as thick as well. This will make the pan heat up more quickly and be more responsive to changes in heat, which can be either good or bad depending on the circumstances. And I note that the pan does not have a little helper handle opposite the main handle. For a pan this size, if it were any bigger at all, if it were any heavier, 
it would really need that helper handle, especially when weighed down with food and taking it and putting it in and out of the oven. Now I'd like to take just a moment to talk about bottoms. <laughs> Due to warping issues, the bottoms of carbon steel pans are a source of headaches and frustration for many people, especially those with flat top electric and induction stovetops. Sometimes, as it heats, carbon steel will tend to warp, creating a high spot, causing a pan to either spin or not make good contact with the cooking surface. No big deal on a gas stove, but on a flat top, as the pan is heated by direct contact with the cooktop, this is a significant issue. In fact, in another video, I showed this warping happening in real time as my beloved Matford pan warped on an induction burner. So this is a valid complaint. Now I had someone with an engineering background write in and say that when you heat a carbon steel pan, you're basically fighting physics. When that metal heats up, it has no choice but to expand. And that expansion has to go somewhere, and in turn, the pan changes shape. You hope that it goes back into shape when it cools, but that is not always the case. Now what Lodge has done to mitigate potential warping issues is to create an upward bow in the bottom of the pan. So with this new lodge, I would say that the pan arrived flat and it has no spin or wobble, but that's not exactly accurate. What it really has is a distinct upward bow in the bottom, which allows the pan to sit flatter out near the edges. Here, using a straight edge, you can really see the amount of curvature they have put into the bottom of the pan. Now their website says that the pan will flatten as it heats. I like this in principle, but we'll show later in one of the cooking test examples that I seem to get an opposite effect with the bow becoming more pronounced and almost creating a little island in a sea of cooking oil when I cooked on induction. Now a few things annoy me like warping a nice pan, so we'll really keep an eye on this throughout the cooking test. Speaking of which, let's cook some food. I want to really focus not only on the food itself, but also the way this pan cooks on a variety of cooktops. The instructions say it can handle electric, induction, grill, gas, campfire, and more. We're gonna hit most of those. And since Lodge has really positioned its brand image in the outdoor cooking segment, we'll head outdoors to do a little camp cooking as well. I like to start with a few easy tests as I learn a new pan. I like to know which burners to use, how quickly it heats, how it responds to changes in heat, etc. So cooking inexpensive things like potatoes, okra, zucchini, and yellow squash are great to start with. Because if you mess something up, you're out less than a dollar or so. I hold off on spending 50 bucks for a couple of ribeyes until I've really learned a new pan. Easiest place for me to start is on the gas stove. That's where we're going to begin. I'm going to start out with some fried potatoes and okra. Because we have so many tests rather than dwell on each, I will just hit the highlights and main takeaways. The takeaways here, out of the gate, we've got good browning. Things seem to be cooking relatively evenly. And what I like most is that the foods don't stick when I give the pan a shake. We're off and cooking. So I moved downstairs to the man cave in my electric flat top stove. I used the widest burner that I had so that I got as much coverage as possible. And I heated the pan slowly because I really worry about potential warping issues. Two minutes on setting one, another two minutes a little higher than another two at frying temperature. So I note, somewhat ironically, that although thinner carbon steel heats up more quickly than cast iron, I was so worried about warping that in reality, I heated it much more slowly. Here we go with a batch of zucchini. I kind of felt like I was fiddling with the temperature a lot, up and down. I used my Etec City temp gun and got some pretty wide temperature differentials in various parts of the pan. For the yellow squash, I felt like I found the correct thermostat setting and the pan temps kind of evened out a little bit and everything settled down. And these things were delicious and we quickly devoured all of them. Browning beef. Now with a little bit of confidence on the flat top, I turned the heat up a little bit and browned a pound of hamburger. The pan worked okay. On the upside, the meat was browned nicely at a higher heat, but on the downside, here is where I think that shallower, shorter side profile really comes into play. Now I tend to make a big mess to begin with, 
but because the sides of this pan are relatively short, I kind of felt like I knocked more beef out of the pan with the spatula than I would have in a Lodge cast iron or the larger Debouille Pro with their higher sides. I made this beef for some sloppy joes, and here, because the pan is new and it still just has its starter seasoning, I admit that I chickened out a little bit and didn't put the acidic tomato -y sauce in the pan with the meat for fear of eating away some of the seasoning early on. And yes, I like a nice sloppy joe. Stove to oven, chicken thighs. Kind of looks like the sun deck on a senior cruise. Here I want to test the stove top to oven performance. So back at the fancy range, I've taken some skin on chicken thighs that have been marinating in some garlic, rosemary, and olive oil, and I'm browning them on the stove top, skin side down first using a gas burner. So five minutes or so on that side, I flipped them for a bit, and then here we go, going from the stove top same pan, no handle protector, into a 400 degree oven until they are up to at least 165 internally, which for me took about 20 minutes. So moving from stove top to oven, the pan did just fine. Here is where having an uncoated handle expands the versatility of a carbon steel skillet. No complaints on the performance, but I'd have to say that if I were making a roast or some bigger cut of meat with the same process, Given the choice, I'd probably reach for the Lodge Cast Iron or Debouillet Pro. Hello, what you eating? I think I got a chicken. Chicken? Do you like it? Yeah. Okay. Induction Beyond Meat. Here I'm cooking some Beyond Meat burger patty things on an induction burner. Oh Lord. Again here I'm worried about warping. I heated the pan on the lowest setting. I added oil and got it hot. And here I think we see that the heat transfer ability of the carbon steel is just not all that great. The pan heats really well in the middle, but even allowing ample time for heat distribution, the differentials in temperature between the middle and the edges of the pan are in the hundreds of degrees. And in fact, you can see a demarcation line between very hot and not heated correctly on the food itself. It's amazing and dramatic the differences in temperature just inches apart. Now with a veggie patty like this, maybe not that big of a deal. If you're cooking a chicken breast, something where the internal temperature of the meat was really important, you might have a piece of meat done on one end and raw on the other. As these things cooked, it almost looked to me like a little island was forming in the middle of the pan with that bow in the bottom really starting to move upwards. Now, as that island rose up, some of the grease from the Beyond Meat patty kind of burned and smoked a little bit, and it smelled really, really bad, I have to say. Not like a nice bacon smell, not like a nice barbecue smell, but kind of a chemically plasticky smell. Didn't like that at all. And how they turn out? Now, I know some people love these things, but as for me, well, this may be why the good Lord invented ketchup. More on the induction. Now I wanted to test that bow and potential middle island some more, so I decided to try benevolent bacon with an asterisk by the word bacon. Now if the word bacon has an asterisk by it, I really don't need to read the fine print. I just assume it says not bacon. It's from California. Imagine that. It says to cook the bacon in an oil pan for two minutes per side. So I used a little bit of extra oil so I could see if that island really did develop, and in fact it did. As this pan heated up on the induction burner, that bow the Lodge puts in the bottom of the pan seemed to give me almost inverse warping. The pan didn't seem to flatten at all, and in fact the bow expanded and I have a little bare metal island and a little C-ring of oil. So in goes the benevolent bacon, the pan holds the whole pack. After two minutes on each side, I took a few slices out, but they didn't seem very crispy at all. So I left some of the others in for about eight more minutes, and they didn't really seem to crisp up that much either. And here it is. You know, from a presentation standpoint, let's be honest, it looks like somebody at the deli counter thin sliced a turd. But how does it taste? Here we go. I 
don't know what it is. <laughs> I don't know what I'm eating. This is the most perplexing food I've ever eaten. I can't describe it. How does it taste? I don't know. How is the texture? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Do I like it? I honestly don't know. It did produce some yellowy, orangey colored oil. Now, is this any better in my arteries than bacon grease? Again, I don't know. Camp cooking. Now let's see how the lodge performs in more of a camp slash outdoors cooking environment. Outdoor cooking is where a lodge pan should really shine. First up, we'll start with a grill. I cooked some actual non-asterisk bacon on my barbecue grill. This can be a good way to cook bacon for two reasons. One, no cleanup of grease splatters on your stove top. And two, your house won't smell like bacon all day. Actually, I don't mind that. It works great in warmer weather, not so much in the winter, obviously. Regardless, remember that when you cook bacon in carbon steel, start the first batch in a cold pan. Then put it on the heat. As the pan heats, it gives the bacon a little time to render some fat, and then it won't stick. For subsequent batches, you don't have to worry about it because there will be plenty of grease already in the pan. Here you can see the bacon isn't sticking, so good job to the carbon steel cooking surface here. And unsurprisingly, a plate of freshly cooked bacon is delicious. Now I think this is a very good grill pan. I would not want to use my cast iron out here. It seems too heavy. I don't want to use one of the French carbon steels either. A lot of mine have coated handles. I don't think that would work very well on the grill. And I think this Lodge carbon steel is a good grill pan. More camp cooking. I moved on to my trusty Coleman two burner stove to cook up some link sausages. Now I had previously reviewed an 8 inch version of this same pan, but that pan was so small that it really wasn't versatile enough to do a lot of in-depth cooking. It was okay for what it was, but I really wanted to get this larger model. Now that 8 inch would fit just fine on these camp stoves, but the 12 inch was almost a little bit too big. I couldn't really get it centered over the burner with the windscreens up on my camp stove. So what I did was pull out my 3 burner Coleman camp stove, and it was the same. So I just cooked with the windscreens down and resolved to ask my wife if I could buy a bigger, fancier Camp Chef outdoor stove later. Honey, another Camp Stove. What do you think? Now the pan cooked just fine. It seems right at home on a camping stove, but can someone tell me what on earth this sausage is doing? Never seen anything like this. Again, I'm a little bit perplexed, and I think I'll just save that one for my wife. Continuing with the camp cooking theme, I moved out to our small travel trailer and made some hash browns on the internal stove. Two takeaways here. One, if you are car camping or have a smaller trailer, we pack three of us in ours, space and weight are issues. I usually carry both 12 and 10 inch lodge cast iron skillets, but I can easily see swapping one or both of those out for one of these Lodge Carbon Steels. You get similar camp cooking performance while saving on weight, and I really do like that. And two, I used a metal utensil, which the directions say is okay, but I did find a few scratches in the bottom of the pan after cleanup. The proverbial fried egg test. Now what would a Carbon Steel pan review be without the boss level fried egg test? To test the slickness of the seasoning and the cooking surface, we'll fry an egg and see if it slides around like a hockey puck or not. To warm up, I cooked a two egg omelet, and really this 12 inch pan is too big for this, but I was a little nervous and wanted to do a test run. The omelet slid around okay, good so far. And here we go. Heat the pan, in goes butter, in goes the egg, and... I had to lift the edge of the egg a little bit with a spatula, and it stuck a little. And when I flipped it, it stuck some more. Undeterred, and with a sense of grim determination, I marched back out to the travel trailer in the driveway and tried another. Now with a little extra oomph, I can get this egg to slide around. And this one slid, even after I flipped it as well, slid around on that second side, which is good. But here is the big takeaway. We mentioned the rough surface and texture of this pan. 
Well, I can really tell that that rough texture of the pan is gripping this egg. It's sliding around, but I'm having to use a lot more effort than with the French carbon steels. It's not nearly as slick. And that egg just does not slide around as well as it does in a French carbon steel skillet. So in the fried egg test, I'd much rather use a French carbon steel skillet. I'm going to give this lodge kind of a D, kind of like me in college. Poor, but passing. So all in all, I did a pretty good job with all these cooking tests. And what I really do like about it is that the pan is versatile. We used a wide variety of cooking surfaces. We used gas, we used induction, we used electric, we were outside on the grill, we were in the travel trailer. We did just about everything except for a campfire. And we're here in the dry, dry west. There are burn restrictions. I don't want to start a forest fire, so campfire's out. But the lodge really did do a pretty decent job cooking all these foods. Cleanup, maintenance, and seasoning. Now, I was pleasantly surprised by the cleanup in the lodge. I had my whole arsenal ready to go. None of the cleanups was terribly bad. The ground beef, the Beyond Meat, and the bacon left some gunk in the bottom of the pan. I've also been using this cast iron soap. It's the only soap I've used on the pan so far. It seems to clean the pan up pretty well without whacking the seasoning too hard. I hit that with my Lodge long handled brush and it worked really well. And then once I have a clean pan, I dry it on a burner and use a little oil to protect the finish and the seasoning. I've used Lodge seasoning spray, regular old Crisco, Buzzy Wax, and some of this cast iron oil. They all seem to work pretty well. Now for seasoning the pan, we've shown in other videos how to season on the stovetop. It's not that difficult. So what I want to do here is season the pan a couple other different ways. Here I'm going to show how to reseason it in the oven. I removed the silicone handle protector. Now we're down to the uncoated handle so it can go in the oven. I warmed up the pan. I wiped it down really well with Buzzy Wax. Wiped that back out. Put that in a 450 degree oven for about an hour. Then turn the oven off and let the pan cool down in the oven. And really that's all you have to do there. If something really bad has happened to your seasoning, you can repeat that if you want to. But if you get it seasoned correctly one time, you can just keep on cooking. Now just for fun, and back to the outdoor theme, I decided to season the pan outdoors on the gas grill burner. Now this is a good method for people who have electric flat top or induction, and especially those who don't want the smell of burning oil stinking up their house. You can do this outside. I'm using Crisco vegetable oil here. I put about a millimeter of it in the bottom of the pan. I bring it up to smoking. I pour the excess oil out into an old can. Return the pan to the burner and use a big wad of paper towels to wipe it out until it looks dry. Side note here, my wife claims without evidence that my use of paper towels might affect the weather and climate system of an entire planet. So if it's too hot where you are this summer and you're trying to figure out why, now you know. Sorry. Conclusion. Okay, it's about time to wrap this thing up. Okay, so is this Lodge 12 inch carbon steel skillet a great pan or not? Well, I think it's a good pan, but maybe not a great pan. I'm gonna give it a blended kind of three quarters thumbs up. And let me explain what I mean by that. On the upside, I really like the pan for outdoor and camp cooking. On the grill, in the camper trailer, on a camp stove, I think it does a great job. And I think I'm gonna start taking this pan on camping trips in place of my Lodge 12 inch cast iron. I really do like the lighter nature of the carbon steel versus the cast iron in these circumstances. I also really like the uncoated metal handle in conjunction with the removable silicone handle protector. Together, these make the pan very versatile and maneuverable, actually much more so than some of the French carbon steels, and you really can cook with it on a wide variety of heat sources. And I like that it's pre-seasoned, so people that are worried about seasoning these pans, they can get up and cooking with it right away. So I like that. Now on the downside, I don't understand the rough texture of the Lodge Carbon Steel cooking surface. It's lots rougher than the French pans and even rougher than Lodge Cast Iron. I could feel that rough surface gripping my fried eggs and preventing them from sliding easily. And I really don't understand why it is so rough. It's almost like all other carbon steel pans have their own category, and this Lodge carbon steel is a category unto itself. I also thought the sides were a little too short, and I worried a little bit about knocking food or sloshing oil out of the pan. 
Now as for indoor cooking performance, where I do about 99% of my cooking, it worked just fine on the gas stove, it worked okay on the electric flat top, and I liked that it moved back and forth very well from the stove top to the oven. But I thought it was subpar on the induction. On induction, it didn't really heat evenly, and I thought that the bow that Lodge puts on the bottom of the pan created that inverse warping effect, almost an island effect that prevented good coverage with my cooking oil. And what about value? Now, I paid about $45 or so for this pan. For the same money, you could actually get two Lodge cast irons, a 12-inch and a 10-inch for the same price. For $20 more, you could get into the range of Mapfer French carbon steels that have similar weight, uncoated handle, and slicker cooking surface. If you start out with a good stainless steel, a good cast iron, and a good French carbon steel, once you have those as your foundation, that base layer, then you can add a pan like this. But I would not make this my first go-to carbon steel skillet. So this Lodge 12-inch carbon steel skillet for outdoors cooking, I give it a thumbs up. For indoors cooking, I give it a thumb sideways. Average those out and you get a three quarters thumbs up. A good pan, but not the greatest. Now, if you enjoyed this video, please subscribe to the old channel here. If you didn't enjoy it, please subscribe anyway. As always, I welcome questions and comments and your cooking stories. Leave those below the video. I do my best to respond to all of those. As long as they aren't too ridiculous, we are on the internet after all. Here are links to other videos you might enjoy. Check out the shopping links below. Thank you for watching. I'll see you again next time. Uncle Scott's kitchen. <laughs> I don't know what I need.